So um, I think everyone's in and it's just a minute after nine o'clock. So I'd like to welcome everyone to Wisconsin uh, Literacy's virtual winter virtual conference. Uh, my name is Michelle Erickson. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin Literacy uh, and Wisconsin, non, uh, Wisconsin Health Literacy. We are a, a nonprofit statewide coalition of 70 literacy agencies. We strengthen literacy statewide through expert trainings, personalized consultations, health literacy, workforce connections, and advocacy. And we are very excited by the depth and the relevance of topics our expert presenters will be sharing with you this week. And I want to thank our regional staff for all their effort and thought into the planning of this conference. And whether you are serving in adult education and literacy or in a different field, we believe you will find great value and immediate takeaways to help you navigate this ever-changing and challenging landscape we find ourselves in. We are extremely fortunate to have our keynote speaker to start us off with a unique, inspiring, hopeful, and often humorous perspective. While we won't be able to see all your faces while we hear her message, I would wager to bet that you will be smiling till the end. Many of us on this webinar and many people around the country and globe serving in the field of adult education have been inspired by Ruth Johnson Colvin, founder of Literacy Volunteers of America and co-founder of Pro Literacy. Her tutor training materials have guided our day-to-day -day work and her advocacy has paved the way for our local literacy efforts. From a young age, Ruth realized the importance of overcoming barriers to pursue an education. In 1961, living in Syracuse with her beloved husband, Bob, Ruth learned that 11,000 people in Onondaga County were without functional literacy skills. Shocked by this statistic, she reached out to a number of local community groups. Eventually, armed with a background in business, but no teaching experience, she agreed to lead efforts to develop a local literacy organization. Her commitment to educating herself and connecting with experts in the field led to enormous growth. And a decade later, the local literacy effort Ruth spearheaded had expanded into a national organization with more than a thousand chapters. Visiting more than 60 countries, Ruth has impacted and guided the field of adult literacy on an international level. Among other awards and honorary degrees, Ruth received the President's Volunteer Action Award in 1987, was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993, and was the only woman to receive the 2006 Presidential Medal of Freedom. We are honored that Ruth is here today and to help kick us to kick off our winter virtual conference. So with that, Ruth, I'm going to let you take it away and Again, welcome. Thanks for being with us. My phone went off right then. <laughs> All right. Pro Literacy's mission is to change lives and communities through the power of adult literacy. And its goal is to do just that. What is literacy? It's the ability to read and write and the ability to identify, understand, and communicate in a given language. And that's what you in Wisconsin are doing through your students, your tutors, your staff, your boards, your donors, your partners, and I thank you all. Yes, I'm 104, but age is just a number. It's what you do with, with your number that's important. What have I been doing with my big number? Well, over the last three years, I've been writing my memoir, my travels through life, love and literacy. There it is, a journey taking over 100 years in the making. Why write this book? People keep asking me the secret to my longevity. How could I start a national literacy organization when I wasn't even a teacher? Visiting 62 countries giving literacy training in 26 developing countries, what effect on me? And finally, how can I live a positive life, having lost the love of my life after 73 years together? Looking back over my 100 plus years, I learned that early life experiences helped make me the person I am. And I've shared my long life experiences. I've learned from my mistakes as well as from my successes. Having started a literacy project 60 years ago, I thought you might want to know 
how I started it. Can you read that? Frustrating, isn't it? You don't know if I'm inviting you to a party or if warning, warning you of danger. Yes, I'm putting you, can you see it all? I'm putting you in the, you are readers, in the shoes of a non-reader. But there's a joy in reading something you couldn't read before. And I'll give you that joy. But you know, must know the code. And the code is, think of the letter, following the letter in the alphabet that you see here. What follows a V? W, a D, E, K, L, B, C, N, O, L, M, and a D, E. Read it. Welcome. Welcome to the world of reading. There's a whole chapter in my, there's a whole chapter in my, um, book on how and when I started Literacy Volunteers. And here's a shortened version of it. You gave a little shortened version, but I'll tell you what it is. I was, I was in my 40s when the 19 U.S. Census came out saying that there were 11,055 functional nerds in my city, Syracuse. We take it for granted that everyone can read, but we have required schooling. But I was shocked. Who were they? Why couldn't they read? What was being done about it? Nothing. Well, I can't believe a life without reading. So I had a coffee at my house and invited on the board, people from the Board of Education, presidents of nonprofits, all were as shocked as I was, but only one woman from Church Women United invited me to speak to her group. She represented the women from 80 churches in the area. And I was amazed at that. They voted to sponsor a literacy project but only if I would take charge. And that was the beginning of Literacy Volunteers of America. But I wasn't a teacher and I'd had no training in basic literacy. I took training in pure phonics, thinking that would be the way. But with that first year, I found both volunteer tutors and students dropping out. So I interviewed them on the tutors saying, they obviously weren't good teachers for Western working. And the students said, the problems were, they were probably dumb because it wasn't working for them either. Then I did what I should have done earlier. you always learn later. I called Syracuse University, Dr. Frank Green, head of the reading clinic, telling of my problem. He said he knew why, for my method was 30 years behind the times, he said. He offered to help me and invited me to work with a dozen PhD reading specialists at Syracuse University. I was amazed. It was like the sky opening up. First I learned it must be learner-centered, finding what each student wanted to learn. And while phonics is very important in English, it is not totally phonetic, but it is a pattern language with many sight words, but how important comprehension is. Working with Syracuse University top professional reading PH experts gave me what I thought I needed. And my job was to put it into simple training, which I did in the, tutor, in the book, Tutor. You probably know that. It's now in its eighth edition. And then as more migrants were coming into the country, we needed English second language. I took more training and I wrote, I speak English. Now in its fifth edition, I try to keep up to date all the time. And the most helpful book for tutors is read, reading evaluation. This helps tutors and teachers find which students can't read at all and others who are at the low level, learning which, when, where to start to focus teaching. One never knows how teaching one person read changes their lives. But let me tell you of one of my former students. At a party, I met the CEO of a large industrial plant in Syracuse. He congratulated me on my work and said that all his employees could read and write. What a shock to me, for I was teaching Martin, a maintenance man in his plant. I asked if he knew Martin, one of his maintenance men. Oh yes, one of our best. I explained that I was teaching Martin 
that he could not read at all. He signed his name with an X. The CEO insisted that maintenance men didn't need to be able to read. I then taught, uh, that's when I told the story of Barton. I asked him what he wanted to learn to read first. And he said, the men's and women's rooms. So I told him those words. First, the sound of mm, m, m, n, e, n, n. And he read men, then women. And I went on to pattern words to teach the sounds of P and T so they could read men, pen, and tin which he did with great delight. And I asked how we know which door to go in. That's what I wanted to know. Easy, just watch to see who comes out. People who can't read are often very smart. They've learned to cope in a non-reading life. I then taught the sound of A, eh, using the same M and N in the word man, and he read it. And then I went on to pattern words again, asking man, pan, tan, and a new letter, C, can. He was so excited. Then he brought copies of the words he wanted, dangerous explosives, which I taught him to read. But he was shocked. He said those words were on a huge sign over a big machine. And he went behind that machine to smoke his cigarette. That shocked the CEO. And he agreed, everyone, even his maintenance men needed to learn to read. What about my own early life? I'm from Chicago and the oldest of five children. In 1929, the year of the Great Depression, my father at age 38 died suddenly, leaving my mother with the five children. I was the eldest, 12 years old. But my parents had saved for me to go to the University of Illinois. So when I was 17, graduated from high school, we went to my uncle, who was executor of my father's estate, asking for the money for me to go to the University of Illinois. My uncle listened, but he shook his head no. We're saving it for the boys, my younger brothers. That was my first inkling that I was living in a man's world. So I had no choice. I went to a nearby junior college, which is the grandfather of community colleges. It was a blessing in disguise, for that's where I met the love of my life, my Bob, making a tremendous difference in the life I would live. It was years later that I realized it was still a man's world. For 10 were honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Nine men and one woman. I was that woman. I learned from this story too. I, said, I was invited to South Africa to give literacy training during the apartheid times, but we did not know that it was illegal for whites, blacks, and coloreds to meet. So we decided to meet quietly in a small rural church. The apartheid government learned that I was there and they called me asking if their commandant Pogetier, head of a teaching black army educated men could be included for he had no training. I was amazed and didn't know what to do. So I went to Bishop Tutu, who was head of the United Church with me, asking what to do. He was shocked for they had raided his building, treated him badly. He thought, he prayed and finally said, let him in. So I did. Commandant Pagetier didn't come in uniform, but the people knew who he was. I explained we had no choice and we accepted him. At the end of the training, because I'd be leaving, I wanted to be sure that they understood all the methods. To demonstrate, I asked Gugu, a young black rebel, to be the tutor, and Commandant Pagetier, the white army leader, to be the student. They did well. Everyone clapped. It's true, when working together on the same goal, not only are color and religion ignored, but the background of each person. It's a first step to unity and peace. You know, I have international stories of 20 countries 
and about 40 in this book. And you, you can read all about them and learn, learn some of the crazy things I did and some that were so good. But in the latter part of the book, I share with you how important a balanced life is. Physical, daily exercises, walking and gardening, cleaning, whatever physical work you do, bicycling, skiing, swimming, for me it was golf. Whatever physical work you could do, never stop moving. Second one is mental. Reading, research, discussion, asking questions, always listening, and open mind. Third one is emotional. Trust, forgiveness, planning ahead, a positive attitude. And the fourth one is the fourth one is spiritual. You have no control over how you were brought up. So I suggest you look for the similarities in all religions, in all spiritual thoughts, and help one another. A favorite song years ago was Three Little Words, and they were I Love You. But I found there are so many three little words that inspire me. Did you notice I use three little words for each of my balanced life? Never stop moving, an open mind, positive attitude, and help one another. Here's some more that keep me going. Smile, be happy. Changes are forever. I learned, I learned, I love learning. God is love. And you'll want to add your own three little words that keep you going, such as reading is important. Never stop learning. Education continues lifelong. Do your best. Count your blessings. I hope my book encourages you to look back at your own early lives, for you'll learn more about yourselves, seeing that seeds were planted to make you the person you are. You have no control over where or to whom you were born and how you were raised, but you do have more control over your future. And looking back helps you choose your own plans for your future life. I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. We really appreciate that very inspiring message. I think now um, we are going to open it up for questions. And um, Beth, I might need your help here. We are, I'm assuming we are typing those in the chat box if people have questions of Ruth and her many adventures across the globe um, and her work in literacy. Please uh, don't hesitate to add those to the chat box. Yeah, definitely. Um, you can add to the chat box and I will read it out. Um, I do want to say we have one, um, one chat, Ruth, um, from Vicki. She's with Literacy Volunteers of Marquette County. And this is something I did not know. She said that she, um, it's so good to see you again. And she had the privilege of wearing the Garfield costume during the incredible reading rally at the National LVA Con. con. <laughs> so. So thank you for writing that, Vicki. I didn't know that. Um, I'll tell you, it's lifelong learning. You're going to be <laughs> learning things all the time. Here I am at Heart and Four. I'm still learning, I'll tell you that. And just, uh, um, just a lot of messages just about how inspiring you are um, and how you've really affected our daily work. Um, just as... Yes, I want to want to echo that. Oh, so here we have a question. Do you know any other languages? Do you speak any other languages? I didn't hear that. Oh, sorry. Do you speak any other languages? No, I do not. In fact, I that is one thing I wish that I did. And at the beginning, when I the first ones I went, I went to Turkey, and I thought, well, I've got to learn some, so I tried to take some things. But the next country I went to was another country, another country, another country. So I thought, it's impossible for me. I have to depend on interpreters. And uh, you have to be very careful, though, when you're working with interpreters, because some had their own ideas, and they would put their ideas instead of mine, and people would question me. And finally, I, I 
found out with the interpreter, you discuss things first, and then they have to decide for you, right? Um, thank you. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, what was your most difficult tutoring or teaching situation? The most difficult, I think, are when students are not able to give time to, to help to go forward. Uh, if they're, they expect it to be something, you know, magic that you're going to learn all of a sudden. Once they realize, this is why I tried the first time, as you saw before, to have some success so that they can see that they aren't dumb, they aren't lost, they aren't somewhere else, that, that they can do it. So I, I think my first thing is to make success even little ways, that first lesson you do, so that they want to come back. Mm -hmm. I've had, I've, most of mine have always wanted to come back and we become friends as well because you learn from each other. I learn from each of them and added more to my knowledge, which I try to share because so many people have helped me throughout my lifetime. It's up to me to share what I've learned. Some of my, some of my friends, when they read my book, they said, oh, why did you share what you did wrong? I said, no, 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 there's nothing wrong there. If you do nothing, you make no mistakes. But when you do something, you will make mistakes. But you learn from them. And I want you to learn from my mistakes. Make your own mistakes. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we have a question. Aside from Turkey and South Africa, what other countries have you been to? Hmm, 62 countries. <laughs> Uh, now it's been 26 of them were, were I did actually training. Some of them were, were going to learn things about. And uh, this is why I, you, you, I have another book that you might want to read, Off the Beaten Track. And that has 93 stories from nine developing countries that I, I got. And you can get that Syracuse University uh, Press. Um, I think I learned most from the African countries. Because in the African countries, Bob and I were very often the only white people in the group. I learned what racism is because some of the people were not for us. I remember one time we were in a church in South Africa, an African-American church that was working with people there. They were very kind to us and helpful and we had done a good job. And so we were in the church they were having communion. So of course, Bob and I went up with everybody else. We got up to the minister, the leader, the pastor. He looked at us and he ignored us and went beyond us. We couldn't, we couldn't believe it. I was a little mad, Bob, Bob wasn't. As we got off, our friends apologized and were so sorry. And Bob said, he probably was hurt by somebody that was white. So he's against all white people and we happen to be white. So I understand more and more what racism is and how it feels. But I found also that we had so much in common that soon we forgot the color of our skin, the color of our eyes, the color of our hair, our age differences, our background difference. There again, when you're working together, you become friends. And that's what's been most important to me. Um, thank you. Okay, so here's uh, what materials do you recommend to start adult students with for beginning reading? For beginning reading, mm -hmm. as I say, I have tried to put everything I could in Tudor, the book there, to do it. Um, I kept, uh, I kept, as I say, updating for the reason that I kept learning, but I find that if you can find out what the student wants to learn, that's what's most important. I had one student who had come here, she was only 17 years old, and she came here, I think it's in the book, uh, she came here from Syria on an arranged marriage and she was pregnant and mealing. She couldn't speak one word of English. She gave, they gave her to me. 
one word. First thing I had to do was to get her able to say her name, my name. And then there again, what she wanted. She really wanted to be able to talk to the doctor. She was pregnant. She didn't know that. So her reason for, for words for English were different than the man that I told you about before, about each of my students. So those are the important things that you learn as you go along. And for a beginning one, she's there again. Once you find what their, what their interest is, not yours, their interest, you can focus on that. And that brings them together on all the words. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so from which of your mistakes can we learn as we lead organizations? Well, the first one I told you about, I just took training in whatever I thought was, was right and it was wrong. Go to, the, go to the place where you can get the best answers for your questions no matter what. It's difficult. It was very difficult for me and took a lot of courage for me to call the head of the reading clinic at Syracuse University. By that time, as I say, I, I hadn't graduated from, from anything. I hadn't done anything like that yet. It took courage, but people are kind. Most of them will answer them. And he immediately, because I had good PR, he knew all about what I was doing. And he, he wouldn't, didn't call me and say, Mrs. Colvin, you're on the wrong track. But when I called him, he said, yes, I'll help you. So by, by saying what you'll do is asking for help. Most people will. And then it's up to me. That's why, because people have helped me all along, I want to help everybody else so that they can do it. And that's why I write books. That's why I wrote my, when you read my uh, memoir, you'll, you'll find mistakes that I made many times. I'll tell you one, when, my, when my, my son was five years old uh, here, I wanted him to be independent. So I decided he was quite, quite intelligent, I thought. We, I walked over to the, uh, our, our country club, which is nearby, to get a bus. And I said, you go on the bus. And when you come back, I'll be waiting here. He got on the bus and he wanted to know this too. I thought I'd be back in about half hour, you know, half hour, an hour, hour and a half. Three buses came back, he wasn't on. <gasps> I made a mistake. Finally, he came back. I didn't know that all the buses would, would go different places. His would go very far away. Why didn't I, why didn't I talk to the bus driver? Why didn't I give him some information of how to get in touch with me. I learned from that. So I tell people what dumb things I did, but if you learn, you learn from your own mistakes. Excellent. We have time for one more question, if anybody. So in the chat, Ruth, um, folks are just mentioning, they're really interested in, um, in reading your books. And I wanted to say that, um, all Wisconsin literacy members uh, will receive your newest memoir, I think pretty soon. I think it shipped this week. So you should receive that in the mail. Um, and if you have any questions, ask your RLC. But if you're a Wisconsin literacy member, uh, you should receive the, um, yes, I'm getting Ann Beeson from New Readers Press that it shipped last week. So you should be getting that uh, pretty shortly in the, in the mail. Um, and it's 9.30, so I just, again, Ruth, I want to thank you so much for joining us and for... And if, if people have questions, give them my email and I will answer them. Excellent. Um, I will put that, let's see, I will put that in the chat. Let me grab that. And then I just wanted to say that um, at 10 o'clock, we've got our unconscious bias uh, session. So hope you can take a moment and grab a cup of coffee um, and join us again. And here, I'm gonna put Ruth's email in the chat right now. Okay. Um, okay, so there's, there's her, uh, her email address. So please do email if you have any 
questions for her. And Ruth, thank you very much for joining us today. And hope you have a, a wonderful rest of this. You, you mentioned there's snow there, so we've got snow also. So yeah. Okay, I, I challenge all of you to get beyond my 104. People say when they meet me, they say, huh, you are 104? I said, yep. If she can do it, I can do it. So can you. So I wish you all well. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, my, my grandma just tur is going to turn 99 this year. And I was telling her about, about you, Ruth. So I said, you still got a lot of time, Graham. <laughs> so right, well. you are very inspiring. Thank you so much. Everybody have a wonderful, uh, wonderful rest of the day. And we hope to see you again at 10 o'clock for Unconscious Bias.